Unleavened Bread Ministries presents from your hands, your feet, your side. Unleavened Bread Jesus Bible Studies with David Eels. Can quench my thirsting soul. Purest water made me whole. Let your streams of mercy flow, oh Jesus. I trust in you. Greetings, saints. Many blessings to you. Thank you for joining us today for the Unleavened Bread Bible Study. Father, thank you so much for giving us wisdom and the people that are coming behind us wisdom um, to know how to prepare for the wilderness. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're going to call this Testings Prepare for the Wilderness. And uh, the first revelation I'm going to share with you was given to Eve Brass on 6-7-2011, which is actually where our test with the faction um, started back then. This dream shows uh, spiritual pictures using UBM's broader internet, TV, radio, church, getting ready to go into the wilderness. In these pictures, the relationship of the man-child, bride, and the rest of the remnant church is explained along with each respective work. I had a dream... Eve said that I was in a small building that was a church. It had white walls and a white ceiling. I believe this represents a church clothed in righteousness. The um, front door was in the back of the church. It was a small, single, white door. This door led from the side of a shopping mall hallway to the white church. Well, we know that uh, Christ is the door which leads away from the shopping mall representing Babylon's merchandising of buying and selling um, and the white church. In 1 John 10, Jesus called his sheep out of the sheepfold of Babylonish religion into a white church, meaning called out ones. And there was a flight of red metal stairs leading down into the sanctuary. Well, it takes humbling steps uh, washed in the blood to enter a white church which is the called out ones who have come out. Much of the church haven't come out, so they can't be called the church because that's not accurate. So uh, the front wall, she said, of the church was actually the back and was open, and there was no wall. Well, let me say that this church is contrary to Babylon. Um, what is behind them is ahead for them. For they have decided to contend earnestly for the faith which was once and for all delivered to the saints, Jude 3. So we have placed no religious wall between us and what was given behind us. It's still ours. It's open to us. We we receive it. And that was in the beginning, of course. Isaiah 30 and 19 says, for the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem, which is the bride. Thou shalt weep no more. He will surely be gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry. When he shall hear, he will answer thee. And uh, verse 20 goes on to say, And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, Yet shall not thy teachers be hidden any more, but thine eyes shall see thy teachers, 
and thine ears shall hear a word behind thee. There it is. Saying, This is the way, walk ye in it, when you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left. Right? So she went on to say, it just opened out into an empty parking lot. Well, our church is not attended physically in the flesh mostly, but spiritually by radio, internet, and sometimes TV. And this uh, last part was and will be um, videos, etc. Okay. There were about a hundred people in the chairs facing the back of the church, which was actually the front. <laughs> Amen. And we can see why. Well, a hundred represents fullness, a hundred percent. And we're all returning to where we came from. And the rest will fall away. Um, she went on to say, we were all singing praise to God without a music leader. Well, personal, heart-led worship in spirit and in truth, as Jesus commanded, is where we're all headed, I can assure you. There was a gigantic screen on the wall to the right of us. Well, many join us by internet, computer, screen, or in TV in the past, some, uh, and watch our videos. So it's all screen, right? Most of it's all screen. She went on to say, As my children and I were worshiping with our hands raised, Cindy, a friend of mine and a member of our local Bible study, came through the white door and down the flight of stairs and found me along the aisle. Well, Cindy means light. The true children of light will come out of Babylon and through the door of Jesus and into the true church. She said, I know I'm late. Well, those who are waiting until now are late for the wilderness is almost upon us, right? She said, I had quite a time with my kids, so I just left them at home. But I just don't care anymore. I just had to come. I know I'll find grace for this. Well, those who were considered spiritual fruit in Babylon will have to be left behind if they resist. Those who come out from among them will find grace. On the screen were colors that reacted to our praise by moving around. David Eels would come on the screen and teach us through the screen normally. Well, we will teach uh, through Internet, radio, and sometimes on TV again. But this time, he surprised us all by showing up in person. Well, we've done that too for just the locals usually. A personal invitation to come follow the David Manchild Reformers into the wilderness as it was with Jesus and his disciples. He came out on the stage and stood at a podium. I, meaning Eve, was all of a sudden standing behind him on his right. Well, this is the spiritual place of the bride, which Eve represents. Eve, as you know, was the wife of Adam. And this Jesus is the second Adam. So Eve here is representing the bride. Okay. All fell quiet. He spoke two words and then turned around and walked out behind or underneath the staircase. As I, that is Eve, was left standing on the stage facing the people, they all began turning to one another, murmuring against themselves, amongst themselves, excuse me, 
and consulting with one another and began to slowly leave out the front, which was the back of the church. Well, as we have seen, the factious murmurers are separated from the body before the wilderness refuge. That's what the test is all about, is to separate the wheat from the tares and gathering the tares in bundles to burn them, which he has done. So they dispersed out into the parking lot, which was empty of vehicles. Well, Genesis 3 and 20, And the man called his wife's name Eve, Hebrew meaning Hava, living or life, because she was the mother of all living. And as the disciples of Jesus, the first fruits disciple of Jesus, were called the bride by John the Baptist, uh, they too were like the mother of all living because they brought that to the rest of the body, right? So God has chosen the bride company for the last Adam, Jesus Christ, who lives in the man-child company represented here by the David ministry. This will happen very soon. The bride is chosen before the last seven days slash years, which are the marriage feast. And after this time, the whole party is escorted by the virgins to the groom's home in heaven. The people murmur because they are not happy to not be included in the bride company. But to be included in the true remnant church is still quite an honor. And this uh, parable is seen in Song of Solomon and the book of Esther, uh, Psalm 45. Uh, The remnant church leaves after the revelation of the new Eve to go to the wilderness tribulation. Yes. So she went on to say, the two words David spoke were foreign. I didn't know if all of the people understood what he said. I didn't understand the words themselves, but I knew they had the opposite meaning of the words terra delphi. Well, these words were given uh, to me many years ago in a revelation of the corporate body of the false prophet uh, in the pulpits today and how they pass on their own nature to God's unsuspecting people. The opposite of this is the corporate body of the true prophet, which in Christ, um, in his first fruits, uh, who will pass on the nature of Jesus to his saints in the wilderness. And I'll share that revelation later. So he went on to say, After I watched everyone leave, I turned and followed David through the door under the stairway into his office. The bride will have access to the counsel of the groom through the man-child. Okay. Cindy had left back up the stairs out of the small door and into the mall. So some people will come out and they'll go back where they came from. Okay. Because they don't belong there. Uh, Let me say that children of the light will bring the light to Babylon in a great revival, though. You know, these people will be witnesses of what they've seen and heard. Well, there was a window that had been behind the stage in the church, Eve said, that looked like a store window on the other side of this shopping mall. So we could we got to understand and see what Babylon is. Many people don't know that. A lot of people in the apostate church don't know that. Our small Bible study group was standing around in front of this window. Yep, getting a revelation of Babylon, right? What many have seen in the window into our meetings through internet video and audios from the Babylon side 
they will turn and bring to the Babylonish church. So, Eve said, David's office was next to the window with a small door that was open. Well, we know that a door will open for the man-child ministry to bring the true gospel to the Babylonish church. Uh, he went on to say there were about ten chairs in his office, no books or bookshelves, and no desk. It was a temporary set a step up with cubicle-like walls. Well, that's because the books are no longer necessary for the word of God's law has been written on the hearts of the man-child reformers. Jesus didn't carry a bunch of books with him, but it was all in him, right? And this was to instruct the bride and the church. Ten represents law like the Ten Commandments. Okay. She went on to say, Our group was standing around in the main hall of this shopping mall, and we were all talking about what we planned to do with the information that David had given us. That was those two words. A revelation. A hidden revelation. Right? Well, we know that they will bring the gospel that they received to Babylon in the coming wilderness tribulation, just as Jesus did the bride in a repetition of history. He sent them forth to the Babylonish religious crowd, right? I said something to my husband about renting a U-Haul van, and he said, Oh, I've already got that covered. A guy I know sold me one. I got it for a real good price. I told him that was good. And in my mind, I could see this U-Haul, and it was very small. And I thought to myself, I hope that is going to be big enough. <laughs> but my husband seemed satisfied with its size. Well... Little will be needed in the wilderness, for our husband will provide everything. The Spirit seemed to be telling me in the dream or showing me that he would be going alone without his wife and children. Well, we know that Joseph, Moses, and Jesus entered the seven years without their families who came later because of their faith and obedience, and it will be the same with many of our families. Don't worry about your family. Just pray for them, right? I looked at his face, and he told me about this U-Haul, and he was happy and excited, and we were all excited. Well, who wouldn't be excited if they knew that God is coming in his people in the great latter rain revival. So whatever these two words meant to us, she said, it was like we were all moving somewhere soon. But we all had to go home and figure out what to take and how to get there ourselves. <laughs> so everyone was peaceful and calm and just talking with us and among themselves. They were excited about the two words uh, more than they were concerned about what to take. That's a good idea. So God is going to restore the leadership, anointing, and truth that will cause the saints to walk fully in the steps of Jesus into the wilderness tribulation. Praise the Lord. If you don't believe it, you just hang on. You will see. I was not sure whether to pack anything or not. In other words, what the bride will need in the wilderness, right? She said, I felt a little lost. I walked back into David's office uh, through the other door into the church and onto the stage. And as I was looking out onto the empty chairs and the parking lot, it was dark 
It was dark outside during this entire dream. Well, we're seeing the greater darkness will be upon the world when the bride goes to the wilderness tribulation. All right. She said, David came up behind me. He told me he had just received a revelation from the Lord that we need to leave as soon as possible and get away from there. Well, we must be in the safe place of abiding in Jesus Christ before judgment takes many away. She said, he told me that he didn't know exactly where we were to go yet, and Moses didn't know either, right? But that he would let us know the next day. He told me that it was very important to only go with the clothes on our backs, quote-unquote. He said this twice and patted my right shoulder with urgency. So, the bride's provision and protection in the wilderness are the brilliant clothes that she wears. He said, just take the clothes on your back, right? Which in Revelation 19 and 8 says, are the righteous acts of the saints. Hmm. So, this is being dressed up with Jesus, as in Romans 13 and 12. The night is far spent, there is the darkness, and the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, like its clothing, right? Cast it off. And let us put on the armor of light. So that's clothing that is light and protection, right? Let us walk becomingly as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and jealousy. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's putting on his actions, which is what we do. If everyone says that they abide in Christ, let them walk as he walked, the Bible says. And make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Okay, so that's it. Take off the bad clothing, put on the good clothing. You're ready to go. And that's all you need in this coming wilderness. Some people think they need a lot of provision. He then went back through the door under the stairway. As I looked back out from the stage, Cindy, children of light, meaning, had returned and come back down the stairs and said, Well, I tried to go home and think about what to pack, but I only packed a few things because it's just so overwhelming, and I know I'll receive grace for this. Yes, amen. So if we go without man's provision, uh, grace will be our provision, as it was with Jesus' his disciples when he sent them out. You remember how they went out, you know, without a wallet, you know, and without spare clothes and shoes and so on and so forth. But the Lord was there with them all the time. I turned back towards the parking lot, and I saw the hundred people sitting in the parking lot with sleeping bags, tents, coolers, and blankets. <laughs> the complete number, 100%, chosen by God to go into the wilderness, right? They were prepared with their own preparation. They had gone home to pack whatever they could manage to carry and were waiting for David to give the word. The Davids, as Moses represents, uh, the man-child to guide God's people into the wilderness. Right. I then uh, looked off to the right of the stage and uh, building and was transported to Renee's mobile home. Well, Renee means reborn, and she is a mobile home, which means God's people will be pilgrims and sojourners. So she is a, a longtime friend from high school, and she and her husband were telling me how they had packed up their 
entire belongings into a large U-Haul and how hard it was to pack everything. (laughs) Yes, it is hard. You know, the children of Israel, when they went into the wilderness, they took some stuff with them, but hey, it ran out pretty fast, right? Um, So it's hard work to bring our own provision. Uh, It's the works of man. Um, I was reminded that when we moved to Florida, we gave our house and our appliances away. Some will have to leave many things behind. But God had provided us a home freely. <clears throat> they also told me Renee's mom was giving them a very hard time about moving. I was then transported into the back of a minivan. And Renee's mom was driving her around and really spewing out all kinds of lies and deception out of her mouth to discourage Renee from going with us. Well, the mother is, of course, the Babylonish religious harlot church that we must leave behind. Okay. But Renee was staying strong and not allowing her mother to dissuade her. They couldn't see me sitting behind them in this minivan. Well, the world will call God's people deceived and fanatics, you know, as they go into their wilderness, which we'll better explain in the future here. And then I was back on stage in the church. I thought about my husband and his U-Haul and Renee and her U-Haul. So the small one that was easy on the sojourner and the large one that was harder right? Uh, Cindy had even packed a few things along with all the people in the parking lot. So, So those who walk in various stages of the light are exampled here. Uh, She said, there was both dread and excitement in the air. We were all about to leave for the actual wilderness, and I felt a little panicked and worried. Don't worry. Everything is going to be provided. Yes. There is anticipation for the trials and yet excitement to see God's miraculous provision in the wilderness tribulation. Eve said, I haven't even gone home yet. I remembered what David had said to me as he was had patted my shoulder. Don't leave with anything but the clothes on your back. The clothes on your back. And after that, I woke up. So we need only godliness as our provision from God. He prepared everything in the wilderness supernaturally, as you remember. It will be the same this time. Don't worry. Rest, right? So I'll I'll share with you that revelation of the Terra Delphi because it's important here too. False prophets pass on their nature to those who listen to them. And Leviticus 17.11 says, For the life, the Hebrew word there is soul also, of the flesh is in the blood. For it is the blood that maketh atonement by reason of the life. Well, men pass on their life, their soul, of the sin nature to their children through their blood. Christ passes on his life, his soul, which is the mind, will, and emotions, right? And sinless nature through his blood. So, how do we get the nature of His blood in us? Well, First John, excuse me, John six fifty three says Jesus said that we have to drink His blood, or we will not have life in us. How do we drink it? Well, let me explain by using one of Jesus' signs here. John two eleven. This beginning of his signs did Jesus in Cana of Galilee. 
the word sign indicates a deeper meaning. In John 2, 1 through 11, Jesus commanded the servants to fill the six, that's the number of man, water pots of stone, which was actually hardened clay vessels symbolizing man, with um, water symbolizing the word in Ephesians 5 and 26. Then he turned it into wine, symbolizing the blood in Matthew 26, 27 through 29. That's the blood of Jesus, which we uh, drink as the wine in the Lord's Supper. So the moral of the story is that if we are consuming and being filled by the Word of God, the Lord will turn it into the blood or nature of Christ. A clear confirmation of this is stated by John. 1 John 1 and 7. If we walk in the light, that is of the Word, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus is, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. What a promise. And 6 and 63, John 6 and 63, the words that I have spoken unto you are spirit and are life. So there you have it. Those words are that life, that life that's receiving, the, uh, that comes to you as you receive the blood of Jesus. So the Word creates the blood, which is the life or the nature. Then our words are spirit, and they have the power, if received, to manifest our life in others. John 7 and 38. He that believeth on me, as said the Scriptures, has said, From within him shall flow rivers of living water. In other words, Spirit words. The key then is receiving words, as the Scripture hath said. And it can't be man's words, it has to be God's words. And that's so that we may pass on God's words which recreate His blood or His nature. Another word created um, creates another blood or nature. And if you pollute it with man's thinking, it has no power to bring forth the life of Christ in you. Have you not seen uh, cult leaders pass on their nature by their words? It's supernatural. You can see it. It's a demon infestation. But have you not seen apostate Christian leaders pass on a different spirit preaching another Jesus with a different gospel, as Paul called it. That's 2 Corinthians 11 and 4. In Proverbs 18 and 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Do you love the Word of God? Well, you'll be tested to prove that. Many years ago, I had a dream that taught this. I was casting out demons in a church when I noticed that the church building was made all of woodwork. The columns, the walls, everything was all wood grain, and it was all stained with blood. And I said to the people, quote, I'm going to prove to you that this is not the blood of Jesus, unquote. Then, addressing the blood, I said, quote, Go in the name of Jesus, unquote. And it disappeared. Well, that's been my ministry, basically. And after this, I noticed on uh, the pulpit a note. It was fluttering as if to catch my attention. And I knew that the pastor of this church had left me the note about himself. And it read, quote, I'm being groomed to be the Terra Delphi, 
unquote. So the interpretation is this. All of the demons identified this as a Babylonish church, Revelation 18 and 2. The woodwork symbolized the human nature, 2 Timothy 2 and 20 and Jeremiah 5 and 14. For men are symbolized as trees. And uh, the blood of the wood is the nature of another Jesus given to the people through a different gospel by a false prophet with a different spirit. 2 Corinthians 11 and 4. He is coming to maturity as the Terra Delphi. Terra means earthly. Delphi was a town in ancient Greece famous for the temple of Apollo and the Delphic Oracle, which was his false prophet. So Apollo was the Greek and Roman god of light, healing, prophecy, music, and manly beauty. Well, we've got a lot of this in the churches, but it's not quite right, right? And this sounds very much like a false Jesus, doesn't it? And obviously, even the pictures are of a false Jesus, you know, because he looks really nice, but the Bible says he wasn't that way. God didn't want everybody to be drawn to him because he was a nice-looking guy. So obviously, the false prophet passes on his nature to worship a false Christ in the temple. The earthly false prophet is in many pulpits, reproducing after its own kind. So you seek out your own salvation with fear and trembling, the Bible says, and pray for the truth, even if you think that you have it. Okay? So, again, we're talking about these testings and trials that bring us into the place where we can go into the wilderness refuge. Um, the world is going to be a wilderness, so if you're talking physical, there's going to be trouble for everybody. But there's a refuge for God's people, and it's Him. <laughs> so, um, and His provision is with Him too, right? So we're going to share this other revelation. Uh, uh, we called it Angel's Guide to the Refuge, Eve Brast. And this was on 7-15-2008. It was dark outside, and it seemed like we had spent the night there. Suddenly, the next morning, late in the morning, a young man with short brown hair burst through the front glass door and braced it open with his foot, and said very excitedly, David said, it's time to go to the wilderness, quote-unquote. We, that is our UBM study group, all hurried out into the parking lot with the kids, and a supersonic noise got my attention. I believe this represents uh, UBM study groups and families, you know, all over the world and are waiting for this direction. I thought it was a jet plane flying overhead, but as I looked up into the sky, there were no clouds and the sky was blue and it was about 11 o'clock a.m. I saw an arrow-shaped vapor trail just clearing the mall on my right, high up in the sky, and flying overhead towards the left horizon. It went all the way around the world, and I believe this is to give direction to saints all around the world. And then I watched it come up from the horizon ahead of me, and I followed it overhead and turned around to watch it head down the horizon behind me. But it stopped 30 degrees up from the horizon and faced us. We realized it wasn't a jet, but an angel. He had golden, 
curled hair and a simple white robe with a thin gold rope around his waist. He motioned with his right arm and forefinger to follow him in that direction. So we all started to walk in that direction. Well, this was a long time ago, but I want to tell you the angels uh, have been with us in the last couple of years in a very strong way in giving us direction. Some people say, oh, no, that's not possible, but they haven't read the Bible, have they? So at the time of the man-child's birth, um, the angels showed up uh, in multitudes to the shepherds, which we, is the same word for pastors, okay? Well, this is when she woke up. And the angels will guide the saints to wilderness refuges. You can't go there on your own, and everybody's not supposed to be there, obviously. Some people don't need a refuge from the troubles. The troubles are what's going to bring them to the Lord. Okay? So the arrow-shaped vapor trail cleared the roof of the mall from the east, heading west down past the horizon around the world, and came up the northern horizon and headed over our heads towards the southern horizon, and then stopped 30 degrees from the southern horizon. Our UBM group then all began to walk towards the direction of the south, following the angel. Our UBM group was located in Texas, which means friends. <laughs> So, so when the people of God left Egypt to go to the wilderness refuge from the beast, they went south first and then went north to their promised land. Just to put, make a little point here. She said, I felt the dream in the dream that this angel was showing multiple groups of people at the same time around the world where their refuges were. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, let me say, it was an angel of God that guided Israel into the wilderness place of safety from the beast kingdom, Exodus 12 and 37. 13 and 20, and 14 and 19. And I believe that God's angels will do this for UBM saints all over the world, uh, to say nothing of all the rest of the saints out there that don't have any connection to UBM. Okay. So, uh, three angels in Revelation 14, 6 through 9, preach their gospel, warn of judgment, which was the fall of Babylon, and the mark of the beast from the mid-heaven, they preached it. And all of this before the middle of the tribulation. So, the angels are going to warn of these coming things. Okay, uh, some people say, oh no, our angels don't have, they just sit up on the clouds and twiddle their thumbs and wait till we get through. And no, no, they don't. They're ministering spirits sent forth to do service for them that are heirs of salvation, Paul said, right? So the Lord will have us use the Starlink satellites, I believe, to reach the population of Earth. That's just one method. Another is quite powerful, too. Uh, with this same message, and will guide the elect to the wilderness refuges. Satellites are also commonly called birds, right? So, Revelation 12 and 13, And when the dragon saw that he was cast down to the earth, which is happening as we speak, he persecuted the woman that brought forth the man-child. Yes, he did. Uh, and there were given to the woman the two wings of the great eagle, that's a bird, that she might uh, fly into the wilderness unto her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and a half a times 
and that is three and a half years, from the face of the serpent. That's protection, right? Amen. So now I want to share another one with you. We called it Entering the Cleft. I'm going to say this is anonymous. It was given in 2-5-2011. This dream came just before the faction began. The faction test began in 2011. And this dream is accurate. I had a dream where I stood in front of an expansive outdoor scene. It was a nice sunny day. The ground was rough, rocky, and not much grass. What grass there was was dry with little green. In front of me and to the left was a huge black mountain face with a narrow crack or cleft straight down the center of it. Sunlight streamed from inside the cleft and it looked like it was a very nice day beyond that cleft. This cleft was just wide enough for one person to walk through with maybe a regular-sized backpack on. Hmm. At the bottom of the cleft in the mountain was a rather narrow path, only wide enough for one person to walk. You know, we're all individual. You'll notice that one person had to go through there. Everybody goes through this uh, with their own trials and tribulations into the presence of God, into the provision of the cleft of the rock. Again, at the bottom of the cleft in the mountain was a rather narrow path, only wide enough for one person to walk. We are individually responsible to stay on the narrow road of God's Word so we can go to the cleft of the rock of safety, which is Jesus. And I'm not saying it might not be a a geological place for you because many of the refuges are in geological places. But if you're not in Jesus, you're not going to be there. (laughs) So... It ran from left to right and made a gentle arch to the right and on out of view. I watched as a single file line of local UBM folks who are already here in Tennessee made their way walking at a regular pace from the right to the left heading directly towards the cleft and the rock. They may be coming from the wrong direction, the left. And we'll explain that as we go. The people walking along uh, carried no baggage. I saw no backpacks, uh, no walking sticks. They were all trained to just, as we saw already, uh, not to back their uh, their own baggage, right? No walking sticks, no suitcases, no canes or walking aids of any kind. We were all dressed quite casually like we usually dress for our fellowships. I was near the front of this line of people, but I was the only person who was not actually on the path. Somehow, I was about two and a half feet lower than the narrow path trying to step up onto the path. I was standing in roughly torn up dirt and rocky ground that looked all around like the earth had been torn up by an earthquake. Well, you know, when people go to the refuges, it will be many times because the earthquakes have happened. And the earthquakes also symbolize the coming of the man-child, because they're mentioned when the Lord is coming. Okay. There was no sure footing around me, and uh, though I only needed to make it two steps to get up onto the little highway, I could not get a proper foothold to step up. 
I kept lifting my left leg to get the first step up, but found myself falling back onto my right foot again without making any progress to even take one full step up to the road. I was right at the road and just two steps and I would be on the raised narrow path, but I just could not get a a foothold to get enough oomph, so to speak, to make it up onto the road, the narrow path. And um, this person actually never did get onto the narrow road. So neither the first person in line nor any of the others coming along after would be able to give me a hand up because the path was so narrow. There would be risk that they could topple over themselves. And there was no banister to reach out to to grab or hold on to and retain a foothold if I could even gain one. It's strictly by faith in God. No physical props or anything to get you there, right? So the idea of scampering or scrambling up using hands and feet did not occur to me either. And having done all to stand. uh, Stand, therefore, having girded your loins, according to Ephesians 6, 13, and 14. The idea of backing up and getting a running start to run up the tiny embankment I needed to climb was also not an option as, again, the path was so narrow that a running start would give too much momentum and you'd just end up overrunning the narrow path and tumbling over the other side into more ravines and ground sloping downward. So as I watched myself try again and again to step up onto the road and fail, I had such a feeling of dread. Quote, why, oh why, could I not make that step? Unquote. The others would surely pass me by, and they could not help at all, as help was impossible due to the narrowness of the way. They were within 40 steps of that cleft in the rock. We were all so close, within just a few, maybe 40 steps, and we would enter the cleft. I so wanted to be up on that road, and my worry and dread was increasing, and my heart sinking uh, that I would not make it. So this dream was shared with the local UBM fellowship that Saturday afternoon. It had a different effect on every person, hearing my explanation of it, she said. Uh, For me, I wondered about possible issues in my own personal life that could keep me outside of that cleft. Some identified with that, And like me, sense a warning to be watchful and make whatever changes in heart or mind are necessary to make that last step back onto the path again. Others felt confirmation that they are indeed still on the narrow path and all is well. Yes, I would say that's accurate. The last part of this dream, this is me now, was removed from our site by a person who fell into faction while he was building our site because it it condemned them. However, I recall very well that there were people on that path who we now know fell away to faction and slander when they were tested. They were all in armor, as though they were making war, which was against us, actually. As they approached the cleft of the rock, they all stumbled against one another, 
which is very factual. That's exactly what happened. Because they all passed on their their slander and, and witchcraft to one another. And fell to the ground, and their helmets fell over their eyes to blind them. They never made it to the safety and provision of the cleft of the rock. Psalm 101 and 5. Whoso privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I destroy. It's a promise from the Word of God. Him that hath a high look and a proud heart will I not suffer. They have all been destroyed except a few who were reformed because they barely entered into the deception and they were restored. But the rest, they're all dead or in that process right now. Okay, once again, this is because the church has to be cleansed of anybody who does not love their brethren and only have self-interest and are in sin. So, this next revelation, we called it Tested to Be in the Ark. It's anonymous, 521, 2016. And the person said, I was with a group of people. We had just gone through some very challenging circumstances in which I felt we had escaped with our lives. Well, this is true. The uh, escaping faction is escaping with your lives. So we escaped the faction dismemberment that uh, took out those uh, not accounted worthy to be in the bride. He went on to say, I was unable to remember the details of what took place, but I knew that it was cataclysmic in nature. Yes, it is. It is cataclysmic. And the person that's taken down by those demons does not even know it. And that we had survived and made it through. And praise God. Well, we had overcome the faction test of brotherly love. Revelation 3 and 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, obviously, the bride, one of the seven daughters, like Moses' wife, right? Write, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and none shall shut, and that shutteth and none openeth. Well, the David man-child also is going to have that authority, the key of David. They will open the door for those who are supposed to go through that door, which is Jesus Christ. And they have been given the key of David to bind and loose, open and shut. Verse 8. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee a door open, which none can shut, that thou hast a little power, and didst keep my word, and didst not deny my name. Behold, I give of the synagogue of Satan, of them that say they are Jews, and they are not, but do lie. They do claim to be Christian, but they do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee, because thou didst keep the word of my patience. I also will keep thee from the hour of trial, that hour which is to come upon the whole world to try them that dwell upon the earth, and I might say, not in heavenly places. Verse 11. I come quickly, hold fast that which thou hast, that no one take thy crown. Exactly. The people that stumbled against one another took one another's crown away. Verse 12. He that overcometh, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out thence no more, and I will write upon him 
the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is the bride, which cometh down out of heaven. Yes, we are being born from above uh, through obedience to the word, right? And from my God and mine own new name. So, they went on to say, he ended up on a ship that seemed to be safe haven for survivors. Survivors of this faction test, right? The ship or ark in the land is a refuge for those who pass the faction test of brotherly love. The Lord showed us this refuge through many dreams, visions, prophecies, and scriptures. He went on to say, all on board were grateful to be there. Amen. And understand the mercy and grace of God to keep them, right? Myself, as well as a woman whom I do not know, were there tending to a group of children, getting them settled in on the ship. Well, let me say, both the spiritual and physical children of the obedient righteous are favored of the Lord. Proverbs 20 and 7. A righteous man that walketh in his integrity, blessed are his children after him. Psalm uh, 112 and 2. His seed shall be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. 1 Corinthians 7 and 14, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified in the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified in the brother, else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. The whole Bible is full of these verses uh, that we have shared recently. As we were doing this, uh, we were talking about all the things that we had just gone through, meaning that t trial, that test. And this is learning how to escape being devoured by the faction dragon through obedience to the Word. The woman was concerned about the threat of some aspect of what we had just survived. And I said, I don't think we need to be as concerned about that as much as them. Yeah, yeah. the factious were rejected from the boat uh, in the land ark, land slash ark, and many have physically died. The factious leaders died by the hand of God. This was witnessed by 14 people. Unlike those who are permitted to remain in the boat, one of the wildernesses is writing a book. Uh, one of the witnesses, excuse me, is writing a book of this amazing story, and it will be received soon. So as I said this, I was looking uh, either out a window or maybe off the deck of the ship, I saw a large crowd of people standing there wanting to get on board, but they could not. They were all visibly sick and desperate to get on board. It's kind of like the ark, right? The faction want to escape the coming judgments, but cannot without repentance. They are spiritually sick and desperate. Either the ship had not yet left the dock or we were still really close to land. Well, the ship had not left yet because it is the earthquakes that separate it from the land. And that is by miles, not feet. There were security measures that had to be met before anyone could step foot on the ship. Yep, it was a refuge. They must pass the tests of brotherly love. 
It was then that we realized that there had been an outbreak of a disease or a virus and that all those people were sick and contagious. Yes, we've talked about it as a disease because it was so catching. And it was a disease of demons is what it was. They looked very sick and unhealthy. Yes, they do. Well, the factious people are spiritually sick and contagious to those who live in sin or do not love. Galatians 5 and 9 says, A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. You think you can get away with not disconnecting from them? You'll find out differently. It was at this time that the woman was tending to some children when a young black girl walked up to her and just started acting very crazy and threatening. Yes, we've seen this spiritually happen quite a bit. The ship is uh, spiritual, and of course this black girl is spiritual. She represents one who walks in darkness and not in the light. 1 John 1 and 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. So she was very obviously sick with the virus. She became aggressive towards the woman. Yes, this aggression is the faction. That's exactly what they are, aggressive. The aggression they feel is that of the demons that infest them. So the woman pulled out a can of mace or pepper spray or something and sprayed her in the face. The black girl ran off, and we realized that she was sick and had somehow gotten through security and gotten on the ship. But then she, of course, left. So this has happened as a test for those on the ship. But it has been less and less as uh, the infected leave the ship or die as they have been doing, leaving a sanctified bride. Then the scene changed and I was back at my home where I grew up. Well, that's in um, his father's house, maybe. Uh, there was a black kitten that got into the house. Well, this represents that rebellion. Cats represent rebellion and self-will uh, against the word and darkness that got into father's house and must be thrown out. But you don't do it in the flesh. You don't do it by contacting them. You can only do it by prayer and authority. The angels have to do it. And they do do it. It was really playful and seemed harmless. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of the viral outbreak in the earlier part of the dream and had a thought that possibly the kitten had been exposed to it and could possibly be contagious. Yep. Galatians 5 and 9 says, A, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. My thought was to get it out of the house before anyone had gotten bit by it or scratched, and I tried to grab it, but it ran. Well, when the demons are exposed, they always get offended in that person, and they run. Eventually, I cornered it and decided to just grab it and get it out of there. I found myself thinking that I would rather take the risk of getting bitten myself than for someone else to get bitten. And I grabbed the kitten, and sure enough, it scratched and bit me in the process. Let me say this, that as long as a person obeys the commands of God concerning factious people, they are immune. 
Demons must have legal rights, which are disobedience to the word. Titus 3 and 10 says, A factious man, after a first and second admonition, refuse, knowing that such a one is perverted and sinneth, being self-condemned. And Romans 16 and 17 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them that are causing the divisions and occasions of stumbling contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and turn away from them. They don't like being marked. But when they have the symptoms, they have to be marked. For they that are such serve not our Lord Christ, but their own belly. And by their smooth and fair speech, they beguile the hearts of the innocent. Second John 8. Look to yourselves, that you lose not the things which, have, which we have wrought but that you receive a full reward. Whosoever goeth onward and abideth not in the teaching of Christ hath not God. That's them. He that abideth in the teaching, the same hath both the Father and the Son. If anyone cometh unto you and bringeth not this teaching, receive him not into your house, and give him no greeting. For he that giveth him greeting partaketh in his evil works. Yes, it does happen. We have seen it happen. James 3 and 16, For where jealousy and faction are, there is confusion and every vile deed. Every vile deed. This, this is true. We are witnesses. Then I woke up. Well, unfortunately, this person thought he could handle the cat. I mean, literally. Uh, representing the faction, instead of being obedient to the commands to stay separate, and was scratched and infected. He destroyed his family and died by the hand of the Lord. Okay, I'm just going to call this wilderness trials. We're, we are children of the last Adam, Jesus Christ. We are a new creation man meant to live above this world and to walk in his ways and his steps. And that includes going into the wilderness. <laughs> so let's read Matthew 4 and 1. It says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he afterward hungered. And the tempter came and said to him, If thou art the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him into the holy city, and he set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou art the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and on their hands they shall bear thee up, lest happily thou dash thy foot against the stone. So the angels will protect you if you stay in right relationship with the Word. Verse 7, Jesus said unto him, Again it is written, Thou shalt not make trial of the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him unto an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And he said unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. And it, of course, we also are being tested and tempted. And um, when we overcome, the angels do minister unto us, but they permit the devil to test us first. 
So Jesus went through a 40-day wilderness trial before he overcame, and then he brought God's people in his day through their wilderness. In our day, those who are in the First Fruits corporate body each go through their individual wildernesses first, and that's where they learn to walk in the principles of the kingdom, which is the purpose of the wilderness. Moses was a first fruits. He went through a 40-year wilderness before he overcame, and then he went on to bring God's people through their own wilderness. Jesus, With Jesus, it was 40 days to be tempted. 40 is the number of testing. Many people don't understand that the wilderness is available to every Christian worldwide because the wilderness is not some physical location to which we go. It's a place in the Spirit. It's a place where we no longer depend upon the world and the principles of the world. And let me say, too, that the wilderness is going to be everywhere. The world is going to become a wilderness, so anybody that steps out of their spiritual door is going to be looking at the wilderness. Your wilderness is in this world. You're being tested. And you have to walk as children of God in the kingdom by faith. It's a place where we are instead ruled by principles of the kingdom. We no longer trust in the world for our sustenance, our salvation, our healings, our deliverances, and so on. Scripture tells us that most of the Israelites who left Egypt never learned that lesson. Psalm 78 and 19, Yea, they spake against God. They said, Can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Well, the answer to that is, Of course. (laughs) You're living it. Well, when they could no longer depend upon the flesh pots of Egypt, they murmured continually, and they found it hard to trust in the living God. The Israelites are just a type and a shadow for us. They went into a literal wilderness, but our wilderness is spiritual. And everybody who walks by faith goes into the wilderness. And when it's solely by faith in God, too, they're going into the wilderness. Everybody who walks by faith in the commands and the principles and the promises of God automatically gives up salvation by works. The promises of God are for the whole man. They are meant to save us completely in spirit, soul, and body, and circumstance. And they are meant to do that totally outside the principles of this world. And as a matter of fact, he even gave us promises that are all-inclusive. Mark 11 and 24, Therefore I say unto you, all things whatsoever you pray and ask for, believe that you received them, it's past tense in the Greek, and you shall have them. Well, so what do you have to pack? If you're a believer in this text, what do you have to pack with you out there into the wilderness? What is it that you're putting your faith and trust in? So why does Jesus tell us to believe we have already received these things? It's because everything that has to do with the salvation that the Lord gave us has already been accomplished. 1 Peter 2 and 24, Who his own self bear our sins. That's past tense because it happened behind us. It's already happened. He bear our sins. Do you have to worry about them? No. Is his body about the, excuse me, is his body upon the tree that we, having died, that's past tense, unto sins might live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. Again, the word there is past tense. So all of the promises that have to do with the sacrifice of Christ on the cross are past tense because that's behind us. Ephesians 2 and 8, For by grace have ye been saved. That's what it says in the original. It's past tense. Through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, 
lest no man should glory. So, you have been saved, Colossians 1 and 13, who delivered us out of the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. You have been delivered out of the power of darkness. Romans 6 and 18, And being made free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. So it's past tense. Even so, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God. Because it's past tense. Um, In Christ Jesus, you were made free from sin. Do you believe it? You must believe and speak it. And when you realize that the Lord has already done this, there is nothing that you can do of yourself to bring it to pass. You have to walk by faith, in the fact that it's already accomplished. That's the gospel. They don't teach that gospel. That is the gospel. I just quoted the verses to you. We enter into the New Testament rest, which many Christians erroneously think is a Saturday or a Sunday. But let's take a a close look at what the Scripture says about this rest. Hebrews 4 and 1, Let us fear, therefore, lest happily a promise being left of entering into his rest. Notice that the promises were made to cause you to enter into his rest because they're already done. It's already done. And any one of you should seem to have come short of it. So all of these promises, we don't want to come short of these promises. They cause us to enter the rest. You see that the promises cause us to enter the rest because the promises are past tense. And when you believe them, you have to stop your own works to try to bring them to pass. Verse 3, For we who have believed do enter into that rest, even as he has said. So you cease your own works when you believe what these promises say. When you believe these promises, you enter into the rest. For instance, you cannot do anything to get healed if you believe that you were healed. Now, I'm not talking about legalism. You can't put this on anybody. They have to individually have their faith. If, as some preachers do, put you under a law to do this, that person will fail because you can't enter into this through law. It has to be through grace by faith. So the reason that men run to man to get healing is because they don't believe. Haven't you seen a lot of people just die because they did this? Mm -hmm. Jesus has already healed them, but I'm telling you something that I know. For the past 50 plus years, I've been receiving healing because I realize that I don't have to do anything to bring it to pass. All I have to do is thank God. Hebrews 13 and 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today, yea, and forever. He still heals everybody who comes to Him by faith. Do you understand? If you accept that you were healed at the cross and you are not harboring unforgiveness in any uh, willful sin, uh, then there's nothing that can keep you from receiving your healing. Have faith. Believe you have received. That's what faith is. Hebrews 4 9. There remaineth therefore a Sabbath rest for the people of God. The word Sabbath there is the Greek word sabbatismos. And it doesn't mean a day of rest. It means a continual keeping of rest. You see, it's not talking about a day. This is where that remaineth a rest for the people of God. The true people, New Testament people, they're not looking for a Saturday or a Sunday rest. They want to rest from their works every day, which is what God commands. This is the true Sabbath that remains for the people of God. We have to cease from our own works every day. For he that has entered into his rest hath himself also rested from his works as God did from His. God doesn't want our works. He doesn't believe in salvation by works. 
And whether you are talking about your spirit, your soul, your body, or your circumstances, salvation is not by self-effort. The Apostle Paul also taught us, 2 Corinthians 12 and 9, And he has said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You see, when you get out of the business of trying to save ourselves, uh, God's very powerful to do it for us, just as he did for Paul, who went through a lot of trials because of the thorn in the flesh that was given to him, right? which was an angel of Satan, a messenger of Satan. Verse 7, And by reason of the exceeding greatness of the revelations that I should not be exalted over much, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger, same word for angel, of Satan to buffet me that I should not be exalted over much. Now that didn't mean he wasn't going to get healed, because he did. (laughs) People like to say that the thorn in The flesh was a disease of the eyes or some other disability. But the scripture plainly tells us that it was a messenger of Satan to buffet him. And Paul lists for us those buffetings very clearly in the word there. 2 Corinthians 11.23 Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as one beside himself. I more, in labors more abundantly, in prisons more abundantly, in stripes above measure, in deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day have I been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of river, in perils of robbers, in perils from my countrymen, in perils from the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in labor and travail, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, and in fastings often, and in cold and nakedness. And besides those things that are without, there was that which presseth upon me daily anxiety for all the churches. So he was brought into all those situations through weakness. uh, And in Paul's weakness, God made him powerful. And by the way, you did not see sickness in there. Hmm. Because that's something Jesus bore already. Who is weak, and I am not weak? And who is caused to stumble, and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory in the things that concern my weaknesses. We need to do the same thing. We need to be weak to save ourselves. Many Christians today don't receive the deliverance they need because they keep trying to save themselves by their own efforts. Now, God has made ministers for us to be able to pray with us, add their faith to ours, and we can do the same thing for other people. We can add our faith to theirs. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, One will chase a thousand and two will chase ten thousand. But it's still by faith. It's not by works. It's not by methods of man. Yet, what, what did Paul say? 2 Timothy 3 and 10. But thou didst follow my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, patience, persecutions, sufferings, what things befell me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. So what is that? It's because Paul was being weak in that he wasn't trying to save himself. He gave himself into the hands of God because he believed the promises of God. He believed the Lord would always deliver him. Do you believe it? Okay. Second Timothy 4 and 17. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me because he was weak, right? 
that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Some are being delivered out of the mouth of the dragon, too. He's seeking to devour, right? The Lord will deliver me from every evil work and will save me unto his heavenly kingdom. Notice that. That's confidence in God. To whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And when Paul said the Lord would save him, he meant he would be saved like the Bible uses the word for saved, which is the Greek word sozo. The word sozo is used for every manner of salvation of spirit, soul, body, and circumstances. Sozo is used for deliverance from demons, healing the body, uh, salvation of the soul, and so on. So it's the same word that the disciples used when they cried out to Jesus as their boat was sinking. <laughs> Matthew 8 and 23. And when he was entered into a boat, his disciples followed him. And they followed him into a trial, didn't they? And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch as that the boat was covered with waves. But he was asleep. He was totally in rest. And they came to him and woke him, saying, Save! That's the word sozo. Save, Lord! We perish! <laughs> oh, they didn't have a lot of faith, did they? And even Jesus was in the boat with them. And he saith unto them, Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Don't forget, you'll go through trials like that, too. He's there. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He is in the boat with us. <laughs> 27. And the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? They said, Save, Lord. And he saved them. The Lord will deliver me from every evil work, he said. Do you believe that? We're supposed to be going into a wilderness now. You can choose to enter into it by faith, by trusting in the promises of God, because God cannot fail you. If you believe in His promises, or you can be forced into it, along with the church, into the coming tribulation, you see, you can willfully go into your wilderness by just denying self and doing it God's way, His method, His method. Or you can be forced into the tribulation like the church is going to do. Moses went out there willingly. Um, the church went out there with Pharaoh's army behind them. So if you walk by faith now, then you are walking into that spiritual wilderness. And I want to tell you, that the wilderness is not as bad as you've heard. <laughs> the Lord told me many years ago, I'm sending you through a wilderness so you can tell my people that I still supply there, quote, unquote. And he has proven that to me over and over by putting me in a position of weakness. For instance, the disciples never took up offerings for themselves. They only took up offerings for other people. So the Lord wouldn't let me take up offerings. He wouldn't let me tell anybody my personal needs. He wouldn't let me store up my treasures on earth. He wouldn't let me borrow money. He wouldn't let me sell things. He wouldn't let me take any government benefits. And through all of that, I haven't worked for man, and I haven't taken worldly benefits. So, God has faithfully sustained me. You know, all those years, I'm 75, okay, all those years I never drew anything from the government. Yet, recently, I did drew Social Security from the government. After all these years, I drew Social Security, and I gave it away, and I've been doing it every time. 
So I haven't received that benefit, but others have. So I'm not saying this to brag. I'm saying this to say that I've been there. I can say I can say these things because I've been there. Okay. Um, and it's in my weakness that God has been strong. So God has faithfully sustained me. He paid for everything all along the way. He put me in a wilderness, but it has nothing to do with a physical wilderness. And he's never failed to meet our needs. I've uh, shared with you before how I raised five children, and they didn't know doctors. They didn't know medicine. They didn't know anything but the power of God. And God always fed them, except for one time, (laughs) <laughs> when the Lord put the trial of a vast on them uh, for all of these years. And God has faithfully fed us, paid our bills, made sure our lights stayed on, made sure our gas stayed on, and so on. He's been totally, 100% faithful. And we've been put in trials, surely, you know, testing, surely, you know, but When we put our trust in the Lord, He is faithful to bring you through. So we are all going into a wilderness, but it's one that God made, and He made it for our good. He's separating us from the world. He is behind the beast's kingdom. He is bringing the mark of the beast. Revelation 3 and 17, He prophesied it, and never one time did He say, Nope, we're not going to do that, (laughs) to force us into this coming wilderness. The whole world is going to hate us. We won't have the help of Egypt, just as Israel didn't have the help of Egypt. We are going to be thrust upon the mercy and grace of God, and the only thing we really need to be sustained is to repent of our sins and to believe His Word. And when we do that, we also should expect that we will be tried. And when you are tried over and over and you see each time that God is faithful, you enter into the rest. You just hold fast to your confession and hold fast to the Word. You don't even worry about your trial anymore. You just rest in Him because you become hardened to your flesh, hardened to the world, hardened to temptation, and hardened to sin. Romans 5 and 3 says, And not only so, but we also rejoice in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation worketh steadfastness or patience. As a matter of fact, I've enjoyed the tribulation. The tribulation is trial on the flesh, but it's also neat to see God being personal God and loving you enough to look after everything. Even when you're at the very edge looking off of the cliff, He's there to keep you from falling over. Okay? That's what He really wants to do. He doesn't want to share His glory with man, which He has been having to do because His people always run to the world. They always run to Egypt and its methods uh, and His ways that count. Well, the Lord put me and my family in the wilderness, and I'd like to share a few testimonies of how the Lord has been faithful to sustain us. The Lord actually multiplied food for us in more ways than one. Once we had to run out of, we had run out of everything in the house except for some spaghetti. So my wife cooked up a pot of spaghetti and we prayed over that pot because we didn't have anything else. But I want to want you to know that that we weren't even considering that God wasn't going to bring any more for us or to eat because He had been doing this for us for quite some time. So we were entering into the rest. And anyway, my wife uh, cooked up this fairly big pot of spaghetti, and it was about three-quarters full when we blessed it and we started eating. And we probably ate that pot down to lower than halfway, and when we were done, we didn't think about it. We just shoved that pot into the refrigerator, and that's how empty the refrigerator was. 
<laughs> and the next day, when we took it back out, and my wife lifted the lid, we saw that God had refilled the pot. She said, David, do you remember that the spaghetti was down to here? And she made a mark on the side with her finger. I said, yes, I remember. Folks, the Lord had replaced everything we had eaten. God is awesome. You can't get anywhere he can't supply. Think about those Israelites. He brought those Israelites water out of a rock. God can bring you water in the middle of a wilderness. Exodus 17, 1 through 7. Numbers 20, 2 through 13. He can pay your taxes out of a fish's mouth. Matthew 17, 24 through 27. He can bring you flesh out of the sky. Exodus 16, 1 through 13. Numbers 11, 18 through 20, 31 through 34. And bread out of the sky. <laughs> Exodus sixteen fourteen through 36. Numbers 11, 7 through 9. Now, if our God can bring several million Israelites through a desolate wilderness like that and feed them, just think what he can do with us who are actually filled with his spirit. And another experience we had that I thought was even more awesome made me realize that you really cannot get anywhere God can't feed you. Philippians 4 and 19, My God shall supply every need of yours according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. If our God will supply our every need according to His riches in glory, then it has nothing to do with the economy and nothing to do with our surroundings. Even if you're in a desert, it has nothing to do with any of that. God made the promise. He's the one who stands behind it, and He will take care of you. And on this occasion, we came to another situation where we had run out of everything in the house. <laughs> and my wife asked, what are we going to do? I said, well, the Lord sent us here. And she agreed. She said, yes. So I told her, you set the table, and we'll go sit down at the table, and we'll eat. So she did that, and then she and I and our five children sat down around the table with these empty plates in front of us. And I prayed a simple prayer, because that's the only kind I know. Uh, I prayed, Father, you sent us here. And we're asking you to please fill these plates or fill our tummies. That's just the way it came out of my mind. And I'm sure the Lord put it there in that way because he wanted to show me something. Philippians 2 and 13. For it is God who worketh in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And so the prayer had no sooner come out of my mouth when my oldest son said, Dad, I'm full. I don't need to eat. It wasn't long before another one said it, and then another one, and then another one, and then I realized that I was full too. I was so concerned about them, I, I didn't, I then I noticed, oh my goodness, I'm full too. And I thought, isn't that something? He filled up all of us while we were just sitting there at the table. So, you can't get anywhere where He cannot feed you. We didn't even need the plates. Then there was a one time that I decided I wanted to grow tomatoes. It wasn't the Lord. I made that decision on my own. God didn't call me to grow tomatoes. He called me to study the Word of God and go out and share it with His people. But I just decided, well, I'll take on this little hobby and I'll plant some tomatoes. Now, the house that we lived in at that time was under uh, huge, big oak trees. And we didn't have any, uh, much sunshine in my yard. 
except for one place. So I planted the tomatoes in five-gallon buckets. Uh, that way I could move them to keep them in the sun as the season went on. And soon lots of little tomatoes popped out, but they didn't hardly get out to be of any size at all before the birds came and just took them all away. <laughs> and I asked, Lord, why did you let that happen? And the Lord answered, I didn't call you to plant tomatoes. That was your idea. I have other things for you to do. Now get about what I told you to do. So, of course, I told him, yes, sir. <laughs> and I never said anything to anybody about trying to grow up my own tomatoes anymore. That was the end of that. Well, the very next day, a lady who was acquainted with us but didn't know about what I had just gone through um, was going to a local tomato farm to get tomatoes for her family. And while she was out there picking those monster tomatoes, beautiful tomatoes, the Lord spoke to her and said, I want you to pick a bag of these for David Eels. She said, okay. And she brought me a big bag of the largest, most luscious looking tomatoes I'd seen in a long, long time. So, you know, the Lord had somebody that was gifted in that area to take care of that part, you know. I didn't need to worry about it. And, you know, the Lord was kind of rubbing my nose in it when the lady brought me those tomatoes the next day. And I thought to myself, I really couldn't have grown anything like those, Lord. I had to come to that place of weakness before he would do this miracle. Well, we've, we've also been prayed for for specific things, and the Lord has always done miracles for us. One morning we prayed for him to send us poultry, mayonnaise, and cheese specifically. Told nobody about it. Uh, we asked him for those three things, and we didn't tell anybody, not a soul. And that is the way God gets the glory. I remember a brother many years ago who was in uh, an elder in the church with me, and he used to be a part of the prosperity movement where the people would uh, brag out in public about what God was going to do and how he was going to give them this or that. They were confessing it. And, and there is a place to do that, but this was for a wrongful purpose. They would tell everybody, I'm believing God for this, a Cadillac, or I'm believing God for that. Or So eventually somebody else in the congregation would feel like they had to have compassion on their brother in need, and they would bring it to them. God doesn't get any glory from that. So when you ask God for something, just believe Him. Thank Him for it. Praise Him for it. And then when it comes, He gets all the credit. So we didn't tell anybody about our needs, but that day and the next day, all three of those things came. We had a friend who was going out of town, and for some reason she said that this large jar of mayonnaise uh, that she didn't want to leave in her refrigerator until, of course, it would have held up. Mayonnaise is made to hold up, but it was in her mind, and that's what she did until she came back, right? She didn't want to leave it in the refrigerator until she came back. So she brought it over to us. And then another person brought us a turkey and the cheese. It was exactly what we asked from God. You may, and, and this happened on a bunch of things. You know, we asked for cornbread one day and we got it. We were, you know, just, uh, you may wonder, and and the kids asked for things like swimming pools, and they got him, and we would agree, and so on and so forth. You you would wonder, would God do that for me? I guarantee you he would. God is no respecter of persons. He's a respecter of faith. Acts 10 and 34, And Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that Feareth him and worketh righteousness is acceptable to him. God is a respecter of faith, but he's no respecter of persons. He won't do anything for me that he won't do for you. 
I'm just trying to teach you how to be weak and to exercise faith uh, at the same time so that you are in this ideal position in the wilderness to see miracles from God. You don't need a miracle till you need a miracle. You know that? Some people want miracles just so they can say they had a miracle. You don't need a miracle until you need a miracle. Just ask God and let him handle it. We've received so many over the years, I've forgotten most of them, but I can tell you that he consistently met our needs, and we went through many years like that, and we saw many, many miracles. And I'd like to share this next story because it just tickles me. (laughs) My children all wanted to go camping one day, but when I was a kid, I did so much camping, I had had enough of that, I liked my bed. (laughs) <laughs> and I, I was making excuses. Well, I'd, I'd been back there before where they wanted to go, walking through the woods where they wanted to go, and finally I told them, there's nothing there to start a fire with, and really we don't have any permission to cut down any of those trees back there. But they were begging me, oh, Daddy, please. So I gave in. And we packed up our tents and other gear, and we took off into the woods. Now, there was a downed tree in the little opening in the woods that we picked for our campsite. And I want you to know that downed trees were hard to find in those woods. So we set up our tents and I sent out the kids to go gather firewood, but everything they dragged back was either rotten or little twigs and branches uh, or pieces of tree bark, which don't burn good at all. And I told them, that stuff just makes smoke. It doesn't really make fire. And I sent them out again. And while I was waiting, I walked a little bit away from the camp And I was kind of praying and asking the Lord to provide for us. And I had uh, told them earlier that there was nothing to use for a fire and we couldn't cut down other people's trees. Well, I had walked maybe 20 at the most 30 feet away from the tent when I came across this little lump on the ground. The floor of those woods was completely covered with leaves. And this was just a lump in the leaves, that's all. But when I kicked it, as I walked through it, I hit something solid. So I backed up and raked all of the leaves off. And there was a pillowcase on the ground. I pulled the pillowcase back and there was a Poulan chainsaw on the ground. And I thought, wow, wouldn't it be something if this would crank? And because we had a uh, a down tree right there in the campsite, sure enough, it cranked. I cut up enough wood to have a really good fire. And the whole time we were there, uh, we stayed nice and warm. And I tell you, when that chainsaw cranked and I cut up that wood, I was thinking, I'm sorry, Lord. Forgive me. I repent. Because I said you couldn't supply us with wood back here. So God had somebody plant a chainsaw out there in the middle of the woods. So it would be there waiting for us because God sees the end from the beginning. He doesn't dwell in time. He has no problem meeting your needs. He will have it there when you get there, didn't wasn't it that way when they were in the wilderness? Yes. They were tested, yes, but it was there. Isaiah 65 and 24. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. See, he answers before we call. And he can have your provision already there, or he can manufacture it. (laughs) It doesn't matter. There's no difference to him. And when Jesus uh, brought the disciples into the wilderness, he multiplied the food there. 
Matthew 14 and 15. And when even was come, the disciples came unto him, saying, The place is desert. The Greek word there is aremia, and it can be translated as desert or wilderness or uninhabited place. And the time is already past. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Jesus said unto them, They have no need to go away. Give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, We have here but five loaves and two fishes. And he said, Bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fishes. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and he brake and gave the loaves to the disciples and the disciples to the multitudes. And they all ate and were filled. And they took up that which remained over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. <laughs> and they did eat. Uh, they that did eat were about five thousand men, besides women and children. So that was a bunch of people. And Jesus was raised up. Was raising up his disciples to learn that you can't get anywhere God can't supply. He was the teacher. And he was showing them, this is how you do it. Then they went off into their tribulation, the book of Acts, and they repeated what they saw. The man-child, who was Jesus's, uh, was Jesus at that time, was God's provision in the wilderness. And folks, nothing has changed. God's going to do it again. He's just going to repeat it with a larger group of people. Since we didn't have a big worldly income, we prayed for everything, and God brought it. And back before I started full-time in the ministry, we decided we were going to stop using money for the things that we needed. Instead, we started praying for what we needed, and we saw God do just that, miracles to forgive us the th very things that we were asking for. Things we would uh, normally buy with money, we prayed for, and God would bring them. And any and we didn't tell anybody these things. Any money we had, we would use it for his kingdom. Folks, there are different ways that you can enter into the wilderness, but all of them give you confidence in God's faithfulness. You'll find that God's going to be there, and he's going to supply your needs. If you need something, pray for it. Put faith in God. It honors him, and it builds your faith. Amen. Well, all right. Thank you for joining us today. The Lord bless and keep you. Uh, we're getting closer to the wilderness. I'm talking about the forced wilderness. You can be in the wilderness now. Walk by faith. It'll be good for you. You'll have something to lean on, uh, you know, experience, you know. Amen. God bless you and keep you. Bye-bye. <laughs> My thirsting soul, pure as water, made me whole. Let your streams of mercy flow, oh Jesus. I trust in you. Though the mountains fall into the sea, though the rivers rise, I still believe. For your mercy stands and your word is true, oh Jesus. Trust in you. And when I face that darkest night, what will be my guiding light? The shining rays of red and white. Jesus, I trust in you. Oh, sacred heart, in you I seated for all time. I am yours and you are mine. Oh Jesus, I trust in you. Though the mountains fall into the sea, though the rivers rise, I still believe. For your mercy stands and your word is true. Oh Jesus, I trust in you. Though the mountains fall into the 